Okay, hi everyone. I think we can start now. Uh, it's a great pleasure to invite, to welcome here in this hall uh, our guest from Sweden, Gunnar Bergdahl, uh, a Swedish uh, film journalist, a director, and uh, he personally made two films on Ingmar Bergman, one of the greatest uh, film directors who ever lived. And now uh, Gunnar has, uh, uh, how do we call it? Do we call it a lecture? Do we call it a master class? Like he's gonna share his thoughts on on great, great, great Ingmar Bergman, uh, and uh, this is all dedicated to the centennial of Ingmar Bergman. He would be 100 years now. So please give a little applause for our guest Gunnar Bergman. I think it's it's turned on. Yeah, you can use okay. it. Yeah. If it's uh, okay, I, I prefer be standing. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, first of all, I must say I'm I'm very honored to, to be here and to to be given a floor to speak about uh, Bergman this very particular day because this today the 14th of July is actual birthday. 100 years ago, uh, there was a little boy born in Uppsala, a little bit north of Stockholm, Ernst Ingmar Bergman and. Uh, now we are 100 years later and around the world there was, we are celebrating uh, what he was doing during his lifetime. He, he became 89 years old. So, so I'm very happy to, um, and thankful to the Odessa Film Festival and to the Swedish Embassy who are, you know, have been inviting me here to say a few words about this this very great director and uh, if you get a little bit confused about the remark if this is a master class and a, or a lecture or whatever uh, the reason for that is that uh, i was told that, that i should make a master class and my reply to uh, loya loya that's the name lola lola yeah, right. yeah, who is handling all these seminars are you there hi there <laughs> i i re immediately replied to her say uh oh a master class need a master, and I can in, impossibly regard myself as a master. But on the other hand, uh, I would say that Bergman is a master among masters, so let's go for whatever. My little plan here now is to, to speak a little bit about, I would say, about three aspects. Um, I would like to start uh, with, uh, with the kind of personal connection I happened to come to have with Bergman during the years. Uh, and then uh, say a few words about his remarkable films, and perhaps ending, or hope, hopefully ending up uh, with uh, some remarks on what I would say is the heritage and uh, what we can learn from Bergman. It's, because we all know that we live in a very rapidly changing world and it goes for the film world as well and there are certain things uh, concerning Bergman which I think it's really important to take along uh, in the future to keep as, as good as possible as his films. Well, uh, for me the whole thing with Bergman started 1992. Um, at the time I was working with the film festival in Gothenburg. Uh, I was some kind of festival producer or editor or whatever. And among, um, among the very funny things which we were doing was that we had a film magazine and we were a publishing house. We made film books, etc. etc. And uh, the director at the time at the festival uh, he had a very good idea, he would like to make a retrospective over another uh, Swedish director, Hasse Ekman, who at the time, in the 40s, was, many people thought that that would be the next great director in Swedish cinema, and that was at the same time that Bergman was doing his first film, you know, after the Second World War. And uh, so there was a kind of competing, and uh, that guy, became almost forgotten, so I thought it was a beautiful idea because he really made good films uh, at the time. Uh, uh, and So we decided to make a retrospective and we should decide to publish a book and that book need this foreword of Bergman as they were really kind of competing in the end of the 40s, who is to be, you know. And, uh, and you know, this Hasse Ekman, he, he made a film called uh, Girl with Hyacinths, 
And if you ever have the opportunity to get hold of that, please see it, because I would say that's the best Ingmar Bergman film ever made, not directed by Bergman himself. You know, so it's really, it's really high class. Can, then, you, please, can you please repeat the name? The name of the film? Uh, it's Girl with Hyacinth. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Kind of a lesbian story, very good for its time, beautiful and very well, both acted and you know, everything. Well, uh, so uh, the idea was to get this forward. So I, I contacted him, and uh, at the time he, his uh, beloved wife, Ingrid von Rosen, still were around, so she was the one who you always get in contact with, and she thought that might be of interest for Bergman because. At the time, he really kept out of all kind of public, you know, public appearances. So we had our first telephone conversation, and he thought, "Oh, that's a good idea." Uh, I mean, it's uh, really sad that this guy has Ekman he only did some very lousy comedies and then moved to to the Spanish uh, South Coast and completely silent. So he thought it was a good idea, and he promised me uh, uh, that to write this. Uh, you know, foreword of this book. And the next uh, telephone call was a very early Sunday morning in December, I remember. It was dark. And I kind of get up, you know, how it can be very early in the morning in Sunday. Uh, and I grabbed the telephone and this was Bergman saying, oh, there was no time to do this foreword. You have to come to promote it to the dramatic theater and interview me instead. Blah, blah, blah. And it will be on the 28th at one o'clock, and you have to be healthy. <laughs> because he was in the middle of some kind of rehearsals, you know. Uh, and of course, I, I went there, and I was, I was a little bit nervous, honestly, because of course, he was a legend, a legend already at that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was standing, I remember they were standing in front of his door at this Royal Dramatic Theatre, as a little gold sign in uh, Bergman. And, uh, you know, it was one minute to, uh, uh, one minute before, because I knew it was really kind of, you know, accurate on time and that kind of things. Uh, but I was also a little nervous that because my relation to the films of Bergman uh, was a little bit complicated in a way, because when I was a young uh, guy, I was like 17, 1968, and perhaps you can, you know, guess the rest. Uh, I was handing out flyers outside, I remember, outside the cinema where they had a premiere night of The Shame by Ingmar Bergman, you know, really protesting against this, you know, the, this lousy bourgeoisie film which not is commenting the Vietnam War in the right way, you know. Uh, so <laughs> I had, a, I mean, uh, together with a lot of these kind of left people at the time, we had a kind of complicated relation to, to uh, Bergman. And, and the shame which I was protesting against, like 10 years later, I happened to see that film on the Swedish Public Service Television channel. And uh, suddenly I realized that this was a kind of accurate film about the problems which occurs, like here in Ukraine at the moment, when the political conflicts are pushing people into a whole, you know, impossible choices how they should live their lives, you know, and, uh, and just to have the, 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 the horror of the present world along with your everyday life. It's a complicated issue, and I thought, okay, this was interesting. So, <laughs> so I had a little, you know, understanding. It took me some time to, to discover uh, the greatness of, of Bergman. Nevertheless, I uh, entered his room, and I was completely surprised because it was like a, a cell for a monk. Uh, and he had two telephones, a big desk, you know, big uh, desk, so he was sitting there. And then he pointed at some kind of a recliner that he suggested that I, I should be in during the interview, you know. And, uh, and of course I had uh, some kind of, you know, catch some cold, uh, it was in Swedish winter, it was a lot of <laughs> complication feelings around that. And what I, what I immediately was thinking about was the scene in The Dictator by Chaplin, you know, <laughs> when I <laughs> <laughs> doing this uh, level thing, and, uh, uh, and so I, I, I didn't need to be sitting in a very uncomfortable position, you know, like a cricket in that fucking chair, you know. But uh, as always, when he has decided something, which I came to understand later, 
he was really you know enormous generous with his views and his he has really thought it through so the interview itself went very well and I I just write it out as you know without any kind of comment like you know like uh, it was Bergman himself who has written it and he was really pleased with that and I did any, not any kind of you know public uh, things around it uh, so and that he also was really pleased with so he said all right good 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 and at the time he also uh, told me about what he was doing at the dramatic theater at the time it was uh, he rehearsed uh, his, uh, his own play the last cry which was uh, about a, a complete unknown swedish director from the silent era uh, called George uh, from Cal from Clarker. He was, I mean, even the the film historians were you know, not really aware of that person. But Bergman has found a lot of films in the archives of the Swedish Film Institute as he was doing that in the summer time, watching a lot of these kind of things. And he thought, oh, that must be something. So he wrote a play about this, this guy, and uh, he was talking about that. And he said, oh, he's from Gothenburg, I and mean, you are also from Gothenburg, so you should do it. And we did, we made a book about it and, you know, that kind of things. And it was really interesting to see how the, the, the Swedish film history was kind of, you know, rearranged by Bergman uh, at that time, because uh, after his discovery of this guy there, you can find these kind of chapters about this guy, Clariker, besides the great well-known masters we had at the time, you know, it was a golden period for the Swedish film. Uh, you know, Victor Sistrom and uh, Maurits Stiller, I mean, two fantastic uh, directors. Uh, nevertheless, so uh, that was kind of a, a good beginning of our, you know, first connections. And, uh, and then I had become the, the festival director, so we brought this dramatic theater down to Gothenburg during the festival, having this play on. And, and, uh, and I also got the idea that I should ask him to be the festival's honorary president. We, he, at the time, uh, he had been the honorary president of the European Film Academy, which he was one of the founders of. Uh, but uh, during some meeting they had in Glasgow, which uh, to, many to many people's surprise, uh, Bergman attended, he and the Angelopoulos got in some kind of you know, verbal fight over something. I, I don't know the details, but I know what happened and was that uh, the Bergman immediately left uh, this meeting and went back to Fora uh, and uh, you know, never ever had anything to do with, with the, the, the Film Academy more than you know, supporting it in a kind of general way. So I thought, oh, that might be a good idea. So I and everybody around uh, at the time I knew two of uh, his kids who were living in Gothenburg and also some other people who were much closer to Bergman at the time than me and they all said no 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 he won't say <laughs> that's uh, impossible but I got hold of him and I asked him and I said Imme immediately yes to be the honorary president of Gothenburg Film Festival on one condition and that was that he never ever ever have to be present at the festival <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but, I mean, it's a good, uh, it was really nice to, 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 to have him as a kind of supporter, and so, of course, we accepted that, that term, um, and uh, he kept it, even though I tried to, to, try to find uh, ways to, <laughs> to, 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 you know, to get him to Gothenburg now and then during the years to come. But what happened was that we, during this honorary presidency, and uh, as, I, as I was the festival director, we came to, uh, I, I suggested things every year, and we had a kind of ongoing telephone conversation, so to speak, because it was very much on for do, using the telephone uh, as a communication tool. Uh, and he even, he even thought that the telephone itself was better than, than uh, having a kind of, you know, meeting in face-to-face -face, as he better understood what people meant or what they were looking for or what they were really meaning by listening to them. That was his theory about that. And also, of course, it was much more controlled in a way for him. Nevertheless, uh, we started to do things. Uh, we were kind of celebrating the 100 years of filmmaking in uh, 1996. 
And when the when the festival was turning uh, 20, I asked him, couldn't we have a kind of film conversation, you know, honorary president and director? And he said yes, to everybody's <laughs> surprise. So uh, that was the occasion when I, I filmed the uh, uh, the uh, very first time I, I I really spent a couple of hours with him in in Stockholm, and that was in when he was starting editing one of his TV production in the presence of a clown, uh, and that was <laughs> interesting to see. I mean, he 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 had ordered the public service channel, who was the producer, to transform the video shootings into 60 millimeter uh, just to be able to sit beside the editor on a real normal you know editing table to uh, edit the thing and then back to to <laughs> to the tv format um, but nevertheless it was a great experience and we, we had that little short uh, thing presented in the swedish television uh, as part of our 20 year celebration thing but afterwards i couldn't you know get you know hold my fingers away from from all these hours of, of, of Bergman talk. So what happened after the festival when that the celebration was over was that I was sitting together with one, the young editor and we put something together we call the voice of Bergman and then I sent it to Bergman. And uh, one thing is sure for everyone including me at the time and that is he hates surprises. Well, he hated surprises. He is, uh, that was not his best uh, thing you know, he was uh, always very, very, you know, prepared, uh, and uh, that was his way of working. You know, he didn't like surprises. So I knew that this voice of Bergman, 85 minutes of talking head, you know, it's uh, only, it's really a very boring film. He, that was <laughs> what he said afterwards. Uh, I mean, it's only. The talking head, it's a head, but I mean obviously the head is belonging to Mr. Bergman, so it was very special at the time, because then uh, Ingrid, his wife, has passed away in cancer, and he was really, really out of any kind of pub public appearances when we did this. Nevertheless, uh, he, he, I, I got this phone call, which I was waiting for with some kind of, you know, oh, what will happen now? Uh, and at the time I was, uh, we had, had, my kids were still small at the time, it was in the 90s. So I, I had them as this day center, kind of cooperative day center, and uh, that was really nice, a very good way to have kids. But, uh, but uh, on the other hand, I had these working weeks, and it happened to be one of the working weeks, and I was in the kitchen because I hated this being with the kids for a whole day, you know, get to the, so I was all, even though I'm not a big cook, I was standing in the kitchen, uh, and then suddenly some one of the other people there came in and said, uh, "Oh, well, you have phone call now, going there. Oh no, 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 no phone calls. But he, he says he is in my Bergman, and I think he is. <laughs> so I took the phone and I, I and I was really he was really angry because of this surprise, and we had this discussion for like ten minutes about this, and I was really please, oh, please, please. so and in the end he said, okay. Only for festivals, no commercial whatsoever, and etc. etc. So it's been around for, and at the time it was really kind of sensational that he, he broke his long silence because, I mean, like 97, for instance, he they had his 50 year celebration in Cannes, where they, among other things, when they celebrated their biggest festival, you know. They had this giving out the golden palm of the golden palm that the, the, all the directors who still were alive uh, and had received the golden palm should vote for a director to get uh, the golden palm of the golden palm. And of course, it was Bergman, and of course, he didn't show up. Of course not, and not to even have any kind of contact with him. You know? So they, they even contacted me at the time. You know, very angry French people, you know, screaming, oh. But uh, uh, that he was really uh, so that was uh, this voice of Bergman at the time was really special. And then uh, later later on we did what I would say was our biggest and, and most beautiful project together, uh, as we were heading for the millennium shift. Uh, I asked Bergman to to pick out twenty films as you know the millennium uh, Swedish films, 
out of the Swedish film history to bring into the new millennium. And then we should pick eight of his to get them along, you know. Of course, uh, he said yes to this project, but uh, of course it turned out not really what as I had planned it. But uh, I mean, he excluded himself. He, 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 he chose he chose more than uh, more than these uh, 20. I think it was like 34. But uh, nevertheless, it was uh, it was a very beautiful way of starting the new millennium. If you are a film lover, because we started on the New Year's Day on our main cinema uh, in Gothenburg at the festival and every day we have that new film sc screened you know to the Swedish film history up to the festival starting the end of January uh, and uh, of course it started with the Phantom Carriage by Victor Sjöström which was Bergman's absolute biggest favorite film of all then uh, and I can it's really understandable and it was with a beautifully restored print so it was great and it and at that time I also met him and made a long interview because he made his remarks on all the films etc etc and we published a, a book about that uh, project called uh, the 20th century of Bergman. Uh, there was also of course things which I tried to, to, to get him to do or be or whatever but he said no, 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 no. Uh, among these was that we had a project called the 90 Minutes of the 90s, which we did it together with the Swedish Film Institute, which really interesting. It was like uh, every, we had a growing feature-length film with different directors every year. There should be nine new minutes, and in the end of the and then we shoot the stop shooting in the beginning of the of the 90s, and we ended it up in 2000. Uh, but he never uh, accepted. But uh, the good thing with that project, now completely forgotten, as would say, is that it brought back Roy Anderson to 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 make feature films because he was one of these who made a part of that project. And that was uh, looking back, it was really great. Um, <coughs> Well, then uh, I, I, I had some also come, we became a kind of film friends, I would say. That's the reason why he had uh, some acceptance for me, I guess. We had come um, this, this interest of the Swedish film history or whatever, and it was treated in the festival in the way he liked. So that's the, that was the fundament of it. But I, I stopped uh, working with the festival in 2002, and uh, the reason for that was simply that uh, it was before anyone else had said, you better stop now, <laughs> it changes. Uh, so it was a happy divorce from the festival, but, but we still we, I kept up my contacts with Bergman, and I made some interviews with him, but by the phone, uh, for a, uh, I worked as a country editor for a daily paper, and, then we, and it was really cute in a way, because it was... You know, he, when he, he thought that you should be working more with with film things, etc., etc., but and when this was decided that I should be the country editor of this paper, he said, "Oh, right, I was when I was young, I was the, you know, the theater director in that city. Now you should make a big interview with me, and you should publish it the very first day on your work, and it would be good for you." So I did, and it was good for me, but of course. And then we had kept up contacts uh, as one of the things he was curious about uh, was um, very much that, uh, uh, you know, the films he had been written, uh, reading about in the papers, for instance, from Cannes especially, he was interested. He would like me to call him after Cannes and then we decided, you know, like, okay, we have an hour here. And then he had a lot of questions about films uh, I have been seeing in Cannes, and he has just read about read about them in the paper. Um, and he has he had also kind of interesting attitude towards curiosity, because I remember he also you know he had his uh, cinema in Forre, he he created the cinema there. Uh, he uh, I don't know how much you know about the the story of of, of Forre, but. Uh, I, a day like this, I might just uh, summarize it a little bit. Then, uh, he, in the beginning of the 60s, he, he was looking for uh, to have a very kind of a hush, harsh shooting place for uh, this called, uh, like in a mirror, 
uh, the film, I think it came out 62 or something, and, uh, and uh, he had found out that that should be shot in Orkney or perhaps the Shetland Islands in the Atlantic. But the Swedish film industry, uh, uh, who was the producer at the time, said, oh, <laughs> of course they understood that that would be a very a lot of money, you know, shooting it outside in Sweden. <laughs> Oh, we have. I, I think. I think that. I'm sorry. If if you if you've fallen asleep, you should just give yourself a rest. I mean, если вы засыпаете, вы можете отдохнуть. It's a film festival. I okay. have yeah, absolutely, I know, absolutely I know, I know. no problem. I, I really, I really thought to get some energy from it. Honestly, so I mean, uh -huh, okay. please, please. Because it's bothering me. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Then. then, then Nevertheless, he, he, they were kind of worrying about the, the galloping costs of this film, so they really tried to find something instead, and then they suggested Fore, and, you know, and Bergman had never been there, you know, so he very, you know, involuntarily went there just to say no. But he fell immediately in love with this very special island, and I can assure you all, but it is a very special place in all senses. I mean, it, it looks not like anything else, honestly. It's a little tiny, it's not that tiny, by the way. It's, it's an island north of Gotland in the middle of the Baltic Sea. And it's, uh, it's a, some, you know, it's it, the, 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 the kind of trees and the kind of milieu and the kind of uh, grow, growing things there. It's not really looking like any place else in Sweden. For, and it's really kind of harsh and things. And so he thought, oh, great, this is the place. And he also found the accurate spot where the film should start. And very close by, uh, he came to build his house. So that's uh, the spot in Hamar where, where he, he, he lived many, many years later. And then he bought a couple of uh, you know, old farms, etc., around uh, th this area. And at one of them, in Demba, he, he constructed a film studio in a barn where he shot the, the, the scenes from a marriage. And, but uh, it was, uh, and that was a TV production, you know, as you know. Uh, so it worked like that. But it was a little bit too, too small for, to be a film uh, studio. So he transformed it into his personal little cinema with 18 seats. A really nice spot, uh, very, and there he was since then, you know, every day at three o'clock watching films. He was, you know, he was a kind of person who had his ritual, so to speak, at least you can say that. Um, so that, that's uh, the story of about Fore. Now I'm leaving, I'm, I'm losing my, my thread. Why were I starting this? I think he, he wanted to talk about the, the intermezzo. No, no, I remember what I was... Oh. Yeah, I was talking about <laughs> curiosity. That was what I was talking about. Uh, because I remember once... Uh, because what he did in his uh, cinema in four every year is that he was looking at almost all Swedish films. And I can assure you that is something which is... Uh, how shall I put this? In an, I mean, some of these are really bad, so to speak. Uh, and, and, and then, so I asked him once, wh "Why do you see this, these Swedish films, uh, when, <laughs> when they are not uh, good?" And uh, he said, "Well, I'm curious." And uh, and then I said, "Well, I, I didn't understand. I did, really didn't understand." So, what what do you mean? Well. You, you can't be curious on something. You are curious or you are not curious. And I thought that was really kind of intelligent way of looking up things, you know. It might find something. You never know. And that's the way he was curious on films for sure. I mean, uh, uh, during, a, I mean, you can, if you watch this intermezzo, I, he mentioned some films and even more in, in, in the, this the voice of Bergman at the time in the 90s, he suddenly starts to talk about the water world with, uh, with Kevin Costner. I don't know if you remember that very strange film. He had some, you know, like a fish here. But <laughs> it was really strange film. But I mean, he's, he, he watched it and he had fun, some fun and he was curious. And I thought that was uh, something which I tried to 
keep uh, as a good uh, good advice in life you know uh, not to be curious on specific things but to be curious on life or films or whatever it is in general well uh, the, the last years of Bergman's life, we, we did this interview film 2002, it was uh, on the last, my last festival, the one which will be screened here, uh, and he thought that was a little bit better than the previous one. Uh, I, during these years I also had the opportunity to do some films of my own, and uh, of course it was a privilege, really, to, uh, that he was uh, you know, curious on these two. So uh, I remember I mean, sending him, I made a film here in Ukraine called The Voice of Ludmila and I, I sent it to him and he looked, watched it and we had a long discussion on it and it was really interesting that he immediately you know, started to ask questions, you know, didn't you shoot more in hospitals? Why not? Why didn't you have that kind of images in that certain part of the film? <laughs> I mean, and this was the things which we had been discussing most during the editing process. He immediately uh, saw these kind of, uh, you can say, lacks in a way, uh, and I thought that was really interesting. I also made a short uh, which he commented uh, with a, a little feature, as a matter of fact, called The Voice of Silence. And it came out, I think, 2003, just seven minutes, one take, uh, with Lena Endre, who is one of uh, Bergman's, and that was, uh, uh, is, yeah, is, of course, uh, one of his uh, favorite actresses. Uh, and uh, it's a kind of telephone conversation where you only hear what she's saying and not what his, the, the, the other person says. In there. And it, his comment on that was, okay Gunnar, it was good, it was okay, but I mean just put Lena Henry in a close-up for seven minutes, of course it's going to be good, you know, <laughs> no problem, yeah. which uh, might be true. But uh, that film was, as a matter of fact, a little homage to Bergman in, in a way because I I stole this thing from the scenes of marriage, you know, saying, you know, presenting it to you now going to see this da 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 with da 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 so, and also the whole thing with uh, this kind of focus of pain in a single moment with Lena Andre, who you know just before had played the lead in in Liv Ullmann's uh, uh, Faithless. Uh, in, in a kind of similar way, it was really like that. Nevertheless, um, in the late years, uh, when I was the country editor, I made, as I said, a big interview on this time in, in the city, and then we kept up uh, contact. Uh, with the, you know, I was still, you know, I was still going to Cannes, these kind of things. It was, so we had these kind of telephone conversations, not that. Not as often as before, but uh, up to my very last contact with Bergman uh, was late 2005, and as I was, and unfortunately I didn't have a tape recorder on uh, because he phoned back immediately when I was, you know, kind of ordering. That was the way we, we worked, about, but you order the telephone, you know, like okay, we have it now exactly 11. And it will go on for 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, but I mean, uh, he, he phoned back immediately, which was a big surprise. And he was talking about Ibsen, uh, uh, the Norwegian uh, uh, playwright, who happened to be the, the very last thing he did at the Royal Dramatic Theatre. And they were celebrating Ibsen 2006, as it was 100 years since he was uh, away. He died in uh, 1906. But that was a long, interesting conversation on Ibsen, and unfortunately, I really didn't. And he said that oh, this is not an interview. Remember that, you know. So uh, there was nothing coming out of it, and the, and the, and the end, there was you know a big silence. His very last year was kind of fading away. Um, his daughter Lin Ullmann, uh, from you know from the marriage of Liv Ullmann, uh, who is uh, uh, an author has written a beautiful book about that time, about his, his her father's last period called, uh, and about her life as uh, uh, a child and uh, had a legal man as mother and in that time as father. 
called those who are worried or something like that. That's my own translation. But uh, and if you ever ever had the opportunity uh, to to read that book, I would really highly warmly recommend it. It's a beautiful book. It's a, she's a great author, as a matter of fact. So that was the uh, kind of ending of that. Um, if I if I should just say a few words, what I think uh, start all over again, more like a film critic and a film person, and leave the personal stuff aside. Uh, it's really interesting now because uh, around the world, there's a lot of, uh, not least in Sweden, of course, there's a lot of retrospectives, and you know, they show all the films. That, you know, uh, so I had the opportunity to see uh, some of his very first films, and it's really interesting. Some of them I haven't even seen before, you know, it's because he was a very, very productive person. I mean, if you include some of these TV productions, we're talking about 60 features. And uh, of course, you can understand that some of that is out of the reason that the, the uh, film production world looked quite different at the time. In Sweden, we had a kind of small Hollywood thing uh, in, in in Stockholm. It was like a you know film factory, and that were there. That he was he had this his starting point there. You know, he got his first work. You know, making script better and then he also uh, that was also the place where they shot this very first uh, script which was torment and but but was directed by by Alf Sjöberg, another great swedish director at the time you know he was the first one after i mean the ruben Östlund got the golden palm in can last year and before that it was only Alf Sjöberg who ever got one for a, a, a version of Miss Jolie from 1951, beautiful film, as a matter of fact. Nevertheless, uh, it, it's very interesting to see these first films of Bergman. Uh, he was very productive already then, I mean, it was like a film every year. Uh, but they were so influenced by certain things. I mean, and, uh, and, uh, and that's, you had a French film, not least, I would say, on the, and then Suddenly, in the end of the 40s, they made a film called Port of Call. And that is very much a kind of neo Italian neo-realistic film about uh, Gothenburg, as a matter of fact. And uh, working class people there. And, uh, it's very, it's, I mean, you can really see how he's trying and seeking. And and, 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 then. and then in the 50s, he's, you know, he's really getting on, you know. He has, uh, there is a Swedish documentary coming out this year, which was premiered in Cannes, and I hope you can have the opportunity to see it here in Ukraine as soon as possible, called uh, 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 Ingmar Bergman, A Year Alive, by a young woman called Jane Magnusson. It's, uh, uh, and she has the good, very brilliant idea to start as a starting point uh, of, of describing Bergman's uh, life and work the year 1957, because I mean, it's in, I mean, if you look up on it, it's absolutely incredible. They made the Seven Seal and they made White Strawberries and they put up several five hour long plays here and there, you know, different places in, in, in Sweden. And he got the new kids and another relation, and it was, you know, completely chaotic life and so productive. Uh, but it, that would go for most of the 50s, I would say. I mean, he was very early on doing things which really were, how shall I say, it, putting boundaries of filmmaking a little bit. Uh, we came to talk about Summer with Monica here before. Uh, that was came out 1951, I think. Uh, it's, it, it's, you know, it's the very first f new wave film, so to speak. He left the studio, went out in the archipelago, he was doing these kind of things, and has also this kind of a brilliant moment of both breaking the, the illusion of film and strongly it at the same time. When uh, the lead actress Harriet Anderson, she's absolutely brilliant and she's still around and she's a very funny person, she turns, turns her head and look, she looks into the camera without any reason, you know, it's not explained in the film. She's, she's trying, kind of breaking the, the illusion of the story 
But what happens is, is that it's only getting much, much stronger into your heart, you know. It's really interesting. And what happened when the new French wave came up, you know, we must leave the studios, we must do this and that. Yeah, well, what did France, Francis Truffaut do? He they did, made this uh, 400 coups, you know. And what can you see there? You can see Jean-Pierre Lowe, very young, stealing a photo of a film outside the cinema. And what film do you think it is? Of course. Is it uh, Summer with Monica? Yes, it is. Bergman, here we are. We know what you have been doing. You know. And there is other examples from the 50s which are so interesting. I mean, it's very normal and, and, and uh, kind of regular uh, saying that in, film, in the film history of things that, that, that Wim Wenders is the inventor of the road movie. I mean, you know these films. Uh, go, travel with Alice and the King of the Roads and all these came in the 70s, beautiful, great films, I mean, best he ever did, if you ask me, but uh, who made the best road movie, I would say, ever. Of course, Ingmar Bergman, and it was 1957, and it's called Wild Strawberries. And, and also with this enormous, beautiful connection backwards in the Swedish film industry, having Victor Sjöström, very old, and the end of his life, playing this old professor, who is confronting his own whole life in a very special way during a travel. It, I mean, that's, uh, that's another masterpiece of Bergman, honestly. Uh, and then, of course, we have the 60s with all these, I would say, even better films. <laughs> my, my, I mean, to here they, they go on the screen, Persona, and I'm so happy for that because if I if I'm forced to pick one, I would say, okay, go for Persona. Uh, so it's a very interesting film, it's a very personal film, it's completely uncommercial film, which is so interesting in the sense that uh, the, the Swedish film industry, the, his producer at the time, of course look upon uh, Persona as a complete disaster, complete disaster. And it was understandable, I mean it was not a, a, a crowd pleaser for the short run, you know. Who would like to see a film about a mute actress in a kind of remote house somewhere in black and white when color film has arrived since long, you know? Who would be interested in that? It's so kind of starting with this extreme kind of strange collage, you know? Very, no, no, no. So of course they looked upon it as a, as a disaster, but, which is so beautiful, in the long run, Persona is perhaps the most seen Swedish feature film ever because it's used all over the world during film, you know, film schools, etc., etc. It will be there, and there are certain reasons for that. Well, I mean, it's the way of, uh, of course, it's uh, what everybody knows about Bergman is his fascination about the human face, you know, with the close-ups, and he, how he treats that in the film. It's it's beautiful. But it's also, there's also other elements which are so kind of significant. And I would say, uh, breaking through certain walls, there, there is uh, what I would describe as the, uh, one of the most erotic scenes ever in this, in this film history. Um, but you can see nothing more than two faces. It's, it's absolutely special. And it's so interesting that uh, when you can reach that effect on an audience, that people are so engaged in what is happening in the film that they start to, to create their own images. That is something which really should be remembered as a key of the, the, the best filmmaking, you know. That's really something special when that you can reach that. Today, of course, we, we all know that we are so you know, overloaded with the possibilities to show anything with the special effects uh, industry or on, you know. So, uh, but on the other hand, when you get the story to be like that, uh, something very special is happening. And I would say Persona is a beautiful and inspiring, still inspiring example for that. And, and in the long run, as I said, probably the most seen Swedish feature ever. Interesting, and in a way, hope-giving. Uh, and then, 
of course we have his German exile uh, there he made a beautiful film called uh, uh, From the Life of the Marionettes very little scene but uh, one of his absolutely best films if you have the opportunity to see it I can assure you it's really strong hard hearing experimental uh, special with the, the German actors he worked with at, in Munich at the uh, Residence Theatre and uh, then we have of course Fanny and Alexander which is a masterpiece but I mean it's also worth to 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 notice that that was Bergman's last film and I think he was really a very clever person uh, if you compare filmmakers with the uh, heavyweight boxers uh, there is only one in the history of heavyweight boxers a guy called Rocky Marziano it was in the 50s he made 49 matches and then he withdrew he stopped boxing he was still world champion there was no one he, 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 no, he had no other but he was not waiting and he said no thank you um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm finished and concerning filmmaking I would say Bergman is the, the Rocky Marziano in that sense he ended up with a with Fanny Alexander and said, okay, this is enough. Uh, I, I'm 63 years old, 100 days shootings, no, I can't do it. It's as to, to get that result I would like to have any longer. And if you compare him with other of these male genius uh, in the film world of the 20th century, I mean, Fellini, Antonioni, Kurosawa, you know, they all try to get there, uh, you know, where they have once been but never ever succeeded really you know, it, and it's also a little tragic feeling about that so I thought that was really brilliant of Bergman uh, smart so to speak so what he did was to write scripts uh, who he let other direct like his son Daniel and Lieven and uh, not least of course uh, uh, the Dane um, uh, Billy August who made his best intention, perhaps the biggest work in that period of, of Bergman. Uh, and, it, and it's interesting because um, the best intention, for instance, is absolutely possible to read as a novel. It's a beautiful love story about the, his, his parents, you know, and it's extremely well written. And I once asked him about it, that, why, why are your scripts so kind of specific almost looking like uh, novels and uh, the Bergman's answer for that is that uh, that is the reason for that is that people on the shooting set should be prepared of the feelings which we are creating so the more detailed things which are not really about what should be on the screen uh, nevertheless could help that uh, to, to reach that thing so that, that was his explanation and that's also interesting because nowadays in Sweden there is a big discussion going on because uh, one of the big publishing houses have published everything almost at Bergman and there is also a, a book called Bergman as author and they're a little bit stating that uh, uh, he is uh, you know as good as Strindberg and well but he, he, uh, I personally don't really believe that he is a better author than, than he was as a filmmaker. He looked upon, uh, he once said that uh, that uh, uh, writing is my everyday, my, my common day, uh, theater is my wife, and filmmaking is my mistress. And I think a little bit about that thing explains some things about Bergman's yeah. But of course, he made. Uh, I, I'm not a theater guy, so I can't really judge. But I mean, I've been told that some of his things in the 50s and 60s were really very experimental, also. I mean, also political. There is something with Bergman which you, you should understand, uh, which is can, can be when we are looking back on him now on this very 100th birthday, and it is that he was not really beloved in Sweden. Uh, it took him very long time, really, because when he was starting, he was you know in the 40s, 
there was not really the trends of the, the cultural establishment which uh, not really promoting him that well. In the 50s, although his really big masterpieces and his enormous big successes in, for instance, Cannes and other places internationally, he got some very, you know, really bad reviews, you know. It was really kind of, no, he was not really there. And then we have the 60s, so, excuse me, I, I, always, I always will one of them. Uh, there he was, you know, regarded as some kind of bourgeoisie shit, you know. And then we have the 70s, when during this period and this social democratic vision of the society was so kind of established and so strong in Sweden, when Sweden really was something a little different from all other countries. Uh, the tax authorities arrested him during a rehearsal on, on the Royal Dramatic Theatre and he went to, to Germany in exile for a couple of years. And then he came with Fanny and Alexander. And of course, uh, that was that, that is still on every Christmas in Swedish public service television. It, it's really a, something very beloved. But at the same time, the society which have seen Bergman develop as an artist was also kind of falling apart in the 80s. You all know that we have this assassination of our state, Prime Minister Palme, and we have the kind of transformation from the social democratic vision of a different society into the Sweden we have today, which I would describe as just one of the Western European countries. I mean, no big principal differences between them. And uh, uh, it's an interesting thought to have and to remember concerning Bergman. Of course, he was a legend in many ways. I mean, he, 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 he I mean, he was he was famous. He was, he was you know you know you know everything. He has a chaotic private life. You know, these kind of things. And in this documentary I previously mentioned by Jane Magnus on this. Bergman a year of life, he, he, she is not at all kind of avoiding these kind of themes and as we live now in these hope giving uh, me too times, of course these kind of issues are coming up and concerning Bergman you can say that all right, uh, he was not a perfect father, no, no, uh, I mean he's, it's said that he, he remember, remembered he, he, the premiere dates of his films but uh, not even the, the birthdays of, her, of the kids, you know, and when he would, and when he died, there was suddenly another new kid coming up, you know, it was, you know, it was really kind of chaotic way of living, but uh, I think you, concerning the certain parts of the, the Me Too discussions, uh, you should have in, in, in mind that uh, uh, all the, these uh, women who he was involved in, here and there, I would say all of them, uh, has afterwards been very kind of friendly with these kind of experiences. That I don't think he was a bad guy, you know, in the style of Harvey Weinstein or something like that at all. And I think that's important. Um, I can say, I, perhaps I should <laughs> oh, yeah, well, look at actually, yeah. But, 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 but nevertheless, I mean, he was a very charismatic person. I had a, I was happy to meet him a couple of times, and I can just, I mean, it was so interesting. When the first time I, I, I did this uh, shooting, what, what's to be this voice of Bergman, I thought it was a good idea to bring two very experienced and not at all experimental cinematographers to this shooting, because I was very unexperienced myself also. But I thought, and I got only one single direction for me saying that, okay, you have two cameras, be sure that at least one is always roving during these hours, during this day, during this day. And that was the only thing I had said, and then we had this uh, conversation and discussion and things. And then I went back to Gothenburg and had all these kind of tapes, you know, and I was uh, putting them into the uh, machine and I have look, oh, what, what would happen here? And then I could suddenly could see that uh, I hear Bergman saying, okay, let's have a break, uh, I have to pee, stop the camera. And then, okay, but I have another tape here, you <laughs> put in, in with that tape <laughs> to the same moment, and the same thing happened. 
And it was interesting to, to notice how these two extremely experienced people, you know, who are like in my age now, you know, have been doing so many things, but nevertheless, when he said stop, they stopped. Interesting. And a little, a little sad because he was playing with his, you know, editing table and I missed some things which I really would have loved to to present to others because it was funny and some jokes etc etc etc. You know, you know. I guess. But that was uh, that was uh, Berman's kind of um, effect entering a room. So it was. Um, if you should say something, just a few words now because I'm looking up on the, the my little. Watch down, seeing that we are, uh, I guess, in your. Ah, oh, you're awake. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but but I would just say one thing. What I would say the most important heritage of Bergman, if you ask me, and that is, not ever give up, the struggle for the artistic freedom as a director. The, the, what the, the French are called the auteur theory. We are living in a time when you know when the influences from the enormous, huge media industry in the States. They all know every. I mean, the the the, the domination is bigger than ever. You know, we have all these kind of channels now, and they have so much money and so much influence, and they are bringing in an, uh, an, uh, a, a concept of filmmaking which is. They, of course, there can be good results out of that, but it is questioning the possibility to explore the language of filmmaking. And I do believe that this is one of the key things also with the cinema where we are sitting now, that people, there must be an audience willingly accepting to see film experiments as in the way the filmmakers would like to, have to test them. To see if they work. I mean, if you, if, if, if not without a remote control, no remote control in the hand, no interaction. That kind of uh, public agreement is something which Bergman was really fighting. He was, of course, doing things for television and forever, you know. But, but he was basically he was so interested in developing the language of filmmaking. He once said that I, I'm very, I'm sorry for that the sound came so early because he thought that in the end of the 20s, the language of film storytelling in, in, in removing images was coming to something very interesting. He was talking about, you know, the, the, these German directors they had at the time, you know, that were, were making feature-length film without any, almost any kind of, you know, information more than what was in the images. And then the sound came and everything was changed and came back. But uh, he, he, w he was really, you know, that is, that I think that is the most important heritage of Burman, that we have to come back to that. It's so important as it is for sure the biggest culture, you know, invention, uh, filmmaking of the 20th century. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I know. It, was, it was a great talk. Uh, I think we can, we can take a few questions from the audience, but first I have a few silly questions of mine. No, and, uh, I just want to uh, ask a question. Okay, so oh, we, have, we, have a, we have a question yeah. from the audience. Uh, yeah, you can, you can you, use this you, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But f first, you told. May, may, may I say one thing first? I, I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I brought. Five books of, of uh, which I. In Swedish. Uh, 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 in Swedish. No, in English. Oh, so, yeah. but, uh, so I, I mean, uh, and I, my idea with this was that uh, if there were a kind of decent and not aggressive questions, yeah. it, it will be delivered to them yeah. in for the first five. <laughs> yes, there will be. No, first my, question, my, question uh, my question is. My question is, you told. You told that he was a charismatic person. Because you are alive here. How you describe, like he uh, entered to the space and everybody look at him. Or he doing something to be, what, what does it mean charismatic? Not, you know, not as a result, film and so on and books, but... 
Yeah, how would you describe yeah. that? Well, uh, I think that's a, a part of the of the secrets of the of humans. Uh, I, I really can't really say that this is the thing because some people do have it, and if you look at films, it's so interesting because about him personally, yeah. how it's expressed. Yeah, well, he was he we was not he understand. was not doing he was not big uh, gestures, but he had this kind of uh, he is famous for his being very angry sometimes, on, especially on technical staff members, if something was not completely, if the, if this fucking microphone is not working properly, huh? you know, very like that. But I mean, otherwise I can't really express it. And I would say you should, you should uh, compare it with, with looking at old American B films and, and understand why suddenly when a certain actor, you know, suddenly you see Gene Hackman enter the film and suddenly something is happening in during that scene. It's very interesting. I don't know, I can't explain it. Sorry, quick but question. Okay, another question, yeah. Okay, Thank you. It was a piece of question. <laughs> Thank you. Go on. Uh, uh, Thank you for the talk. Yeah, can you please stand up? Oh yeah, sure. So, uh, sure. Uh, Thank you for the talk, first of all. Uh, I have a a little theory on Fanny and Alexander. Uh, please solve my my little dilemma. Is Fanny a real person, or she is an imaginative character? That Alexander, you understand my question, right? Yeah, sure. He is the alter ego, and she is almost a phantom of his imagination. Isn't a ring of truth to this theory? Fanny and Alexander is a story. Bergman was a storyteller. Don't trust Latin Magica at all. <laughs> I mean, uh, there are so many now in the you know kind of after he, he's gone, there has been so much things coming up in, in concerning his his real life, so to speak. Don't look upon these things in the family of Alexander as a, as a story about Bergman's Ber you know, childhood. It's not. I mean, in this uh, documentary I keep on mentioning because I like it, Jane Magnusson's, she has a uh, forgotten interview part. It was, you know, it was lying in somewhere in the public service channels uh, archives for, for decades with Bergman's elder brother. Where he has, uh, you know, he's really angry about his younger brother in many ways, and they have very different views on, on life, on what they were doing. But uh, there was no question about who is uh, punished by the, the hard hitting father. That was his <coughs> older brother. So if you ask me to make some kind of, you know, guess about it, I would say Fanny is in Mabayman. Okay. She is the one who watches. And I think uh, that's concerning these parts, which more or less are also very inventive. So you're turning it completely around, right? Funny. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so another one. Yeah, we have we have the. Thank you. Oh, you're you're too generous. You know, maybe we're gonna have, you know. У мене два коротких питання, але одне з зовсім коротке, трошки інше, трошки більше. Окей. Ви сказали, що у Бергмана були проблеми в 60-х роках. Там треба написати кнопочку. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Ви сказали, що у Бергмана в 60-х роках були проблеми з фінансами, тому він втік навіть із Швеції, бо не міг платити податки. А потім ви сказали, що вийшов фільм Фані Олександр. Це означає, що фільм дав йому гроші, він став багатим. Це коротке питання, факт фактично. А друге питання складніше. За час спілкування з Бергманом Може, ви зрозуміли, як він ставиться до кінокритики? Дякую. Що ви думаєте про фільм критиків? 
if, if, first, yeah, the, the first part of the question is that, I mean, he was uh, falsely accused of tax problems. So he, there was never ever any, he, he has just left it to some, you know, lawyers and things like that. And in the end, there was absolutely no problems. So, I mean, his exile in Germany was in that sense without any, he shouldn't have been doing it. But I mean, still, even during these German years, he went to foreign very frequently. So, so he was not hiding any money? No, no, okay. no, no, no. And okay. he was not really interested in money in that sense. You know, he was not that kind of person at all. Secondly, concerning critics. Well, he is very famous for you know, hitting a, a Swedish theater critic in public. You know, really, like, <laughs> and afterwards saying, yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and of course, his, what he said, you know, when you asked him about it, was, oh, I don't care, you know, I never, I never care about critics, etc., etc., etc. But it was so interesting, you know, when Sarah Band, his very last TV production came in 2002, uh, of course, the Swedish tabloid press was writing about that, and they have these kind of chronics, you know, this uh, texts about what's on in te t television and things like that. And who suddenly called these people who are writing these, you know, because, of course, they didn't understand anything, or oh, this is so fashion, and blah, 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 and suddenly they have the phone call, you know. This is Ingmar Bergman. <laughs> Very funny, I think. So, of course, he, he cared about it. What, what he explained concerning film criticism uh, it was that he cared so much about his actors and actresses. That, that, uh, and that's true in a way that they always are really kind of need, uh, I would say, even more than directors, in, if you, you do these generalizations, uh, I would say uh, actors are really kind of fragile people, oh, I'm not mentioned, I'm not, uh, because it's a part of their work to be noticed. Yeah. So uh, that's what he explained, but of course, as everybody, are you, I mean, for anyone who has ever made a film, I would say the only thing you can, if it's a good film, and it's made by the heart, and it's really sincere and serious, I mean, the only relation you can try to compare it with is the one you have with your kids. And I mean, of course, if someone comes up to you and you just have a little look at your kid and say, what an awful looking kid. <laughs> of course you get mad and angry. So I mean, uh, you have strong feelings here. Okay, I think we have a question here. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, was, I was the next one. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, but let me decide next, okay? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Are you interested in the book in English? Uh, he, he will Thank learn. You. He will learn. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon, Gunnar. And uh, first of all, thanks a lot for sharing your time, thoughts, and experiences with uh, such a great director as Ingrid Bergman. Uh, for me, it's very personal because uh, I've been born like the same day, like a couple of years later, but. Uh, I still, but still, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, look, um, I, I, I'm just curious about like few few things. First of all, you, you mentioned that uh, Ingmar was very productive, which is the fact. And uh, uh, the first question is like, uh, what do you think kept him like being awake from sleeping? You mean if you understand what I mean, like uh, for all these years and. Uh, uh, despite of the fact that uh, the actresses, the crew, they were like friends and wives and, 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 and they were filming on the island and so is, is, is a hard job, I mean, like making like one, one or two films like in a year, the several years he, he, he has that and he was screenwriting, he was filming, he was editing, this is uh, like a process, right? And the second question is regarding his um, relationships uh, and uh, working ethics with the crew and uh, firstly with the actors uh, was he uh, more again despite of the fact they were like wives and the friends was he more dominative or it was more about the dialogue or how it was actually i think let's talk about insomnia first yeah right. so what kept him well uh, it's really hard to say. I mean, uh, he, ha he has he has he has made films about these kind of topics, so to speak. I mean, uh, 
the hour of the wolf, for instance, and it's really taken its its uh, title from that period in the night time between three and five when most people are dying and most people are born, you know, and we are. It's a strange. I can't I can't really answer in in some serious way. And concerning the 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 way he was working. Yeah, he was working, you know, very kind of with a big, very big amount of community. You know, he was working with the same first Gunnar Fischer as a cameraman, a cinematographer, and then Sven uh, He was working with the same actors for many years, both on the theater, on his most productive time in the 50s. Uh, it was, you know, like that. He, 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 the same group of actors. Yeah, on the theater in the stage in, in Malmö, as they were in all these films, you know, what Max von Sydow, Gudrun Elimbom, it was all these famous, uh, uh, Bibi Anderson, all these famous uh, um, film star to become, so to speak. They were uh, at the same time actors during his uh, time as a director of the, the, the theater in Malmö. So I think he was, um, but an interesting thing with Bergman, if you compare him, because this kind of extreme productivity do have prices, of course. I mean, uh, you can look on, if you look on Fassbinder, for instance, who had the same kind of uh, productivity. He, he, you know, he went, he, dead, he died like 36 or something, you know, he was, you know, uh, Bergman kept up his productivity through his way of life, and he, you know, he was very kind of, you know, he, 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 he described himself as almost an uh, ascetic person, a very kind of, you know, very no kind of bad behavior in that sense. No drinking, no, no, no nothing of that. Only work. Of course, there is a psychological background which made him be that kind of uh, going and going and going. And some something was, of course, haunting him in that sense. Uh, I mean, it's it's not, it's it's not a normal thing to. Uh, to, to abandon your kids, you know, it's not normal. It's not normal life he had, you know, it was a kind of very strange and uh, hectic life. But uh, at the same time, he was really handling these kind of existential issues in a, in a very universal way. Uh, we all have these kind of moments. Uh, we can recognize ourselves in some of these kind of things, even though they were made <coughs> 50 or 60 years ago. And I think that's very interesting and special. And, uh, and a little bit with the burden of uh, what was said about your great director here, Kira, or you mean uh, Kira Murato? Who, I mean, uh, okay, now, now I'm gone, but uh, still the films are there, you know. And that's also why I think he was really preferring film that they are, they are there, you know. And uh, not like a theater place, you know, like uh, because the, that these moments are gone, you know, they're, they're unique in that sense, but they are not. Everlasting. And uh, concerning the, the films, and the, 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 there is a beautiful effect of the period we live now, the digitalization. You know, I've seen a couple of these Bergman films now in the digital version. I haven't seen Persona yet, I'm going to see it this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to it. They are so fucking beautiful. <laughs> you know, no scratches, nothing sharp. As exactly as Bergman wanted them to be, you know, and he can't see them now, unfortunately, but he would be very happy about that, for sure. I'm really sorry, but this was the last question because we have to, unfortunately, we have to clear the room for the next guest. So, a uh, warm round of applause for Gunnar Bergdahl, our guest, uh, the, the film friend of uh, Ingmar Bergman, the director and uh, film journalist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do nothing at all.